latest episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodram. Okay, so as you can see from the title page, this week we are looking at a selection of bottlings from the independent bottling company AD Rattray. Um, and I just thought it's been, been a while since I've done an independent episode of the show. I seem to have been focusing on distillery releases for the last few episodes. So I thought probably about time uh, I, did, um, I did something different. Um, and... Um, I'm kind of getting up to date. All these samples came my way in uh, February of this year, so pretty much, I wouldn't quite go as far as saying brand spanking new, but you know the, the latest uh, series of releases, some of which are still on the uh, the shelves at Shea Gauntley. Um and um, I, I I I still I, I like what what AD Retro have been doing. To be to be fair, I mean yeah like every independent bottling company they've had their moments shall we say um, but I think by and large I think with the exception of Gordon McPhail they're, they're, they're probably one of the oldest um, independent bottling companies that, that I'm still working with and, and buying from I mean um, and uh, yeah, I always like I say I always look forward to receiving their samples and they, they come in there a nice, a nice little box these days rather than just sort of like wrapped up in um, uh, um, bubble wrap so all very professional. I get a nice printed letter as well. You know, it's all oh, it's all very corporate. <laughs> it has to be said. But no, no, it's a nice touch. It has to be said. And you know, I, I you know do appreciate the, the samples being sent. It's you know, uh, of course, uh, as, as we all well know, independent bottling companies have you know don't necessarily need to send out samples, and there are some that, that don't. And um, you know, it's 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 just nice that they will carry on doing so. So. Um, Better say some nice things about this slot then, I think. Um, anyway, um, no, so uh, I'm going to sort of like cut to the um, cut to the chase, so to speak, and introduce the lineup because there's not really a great deal much else to say, as I've done several episodes in the past on AD Rattray. But uh, um, and um, this might, although there's only five samples, it might take a while to get through them because some of them are pretty hefty ABV, it has to be said. But anyway, let's uh, let's take a look, shall we? Okay, so uh, this week I've decided I'm going to do them all in youngest to oldest, even though there's a few odd oddities thrown in. I'm going to kick off with a five-year-old uh, Dalmore. Yes, five-year-old Dalmore. Now, um, ordinarily I probably wouldn't go near an American oak age Dalmore at that age with a barge pole, but the interesting thing about this is that it's basically finished in X... Um, uh, hoggies, uh, not hoggies, ex uh, octaves, sorry, um, rum octaves in actual fact. So um, it could be, could be interesting. Um, it was distilled in uh, May of 2013, and like all of these samples, bottled in uh, November of last year. So uh, bottled at 59%, which is you know, five-year-old spirit. You'd probably expect sort of an ABV of around about that uh, kind of level, um, and. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, uh, next bottle we'll be looking at is an eight-year-old Royal Brackler. Uh, now, this was distilled in April of 2010. Oh, incidentally, the cast number on um, the Dalmore is 2465, for those of you who like to know these things. Royal Brackler cast number is 333964, originally matured in a Bourbon hogshead and then spent two years finishing in... Um, uh, an ex uh, Hidalgo Lagatana uh, sherry butt, so um, reasonable colour. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what uh, what that one's like. How the, the balance of the two works out. Then we're going to move on to uh, a Bourbon Hoggy matured uh, Craig Lackey, uh, eleven years old, uh, distilled in October of two thousand and seven, uh, bottled at sixty five percent for an eleven year old. <laughs> Like I did say, there's a lot of alcohol swishing around today, it has to be said. Oh, the Brackler is 58.1, so, oh, you know, anyway. Um, so the Kragalaki cast number is uh, 900637, and like I said, distilled in October of 2007. Uh, the fourth bottle we'll be looking at is, uh, a bit of a jump in age, we're up to a 21-year-old Blair Athol. Now, you would have thought, but by the time spirit gets to about 21, the alcohol level will be... Dropping down somewhere closer to 
Oh no, not with this one. This cask must have been tighter than a gnat's chuff, that's all I can say. Um, either that or it was matured in, in a pretty warm warehouse. 63% at <laughs> 21 years old. Good God. Um, anyway, so it is a, a single bourbon hogshead. Um, uh, number 574 and distilled in February 1997. Uh, and last but not least, we have the oldest bottling. Uh, this is in the slightly different range that they've now got called the Vintage Cask Collection. Um, and it is a 34-year-old Milton Duff. Thankfully, this is a bit of more sensible ABV. Uh, this is bottled at 47.3. Cask number, or Bourbon Hoggy cask number 7449 and was distilled in December of 1983. So, um, yeah, fair three figure on on that one. Looking forward to tasting that because I, I, I like Milton Duff. It's a sort of, you know, it's a distillery that kind of just flies under the radar a little bit, it has to be said. But, you know, more often than not, yeah, it produces some, some good stuff. So, um, so I think uh, an interesting line-up. Um, well, let's, let's kick off with a bit of Young Down. Yeah. Okay, so um, Dalmore, yeah, um, more renowned for being whacked into sherry casks and uh, generally speaking, you know, in American oak it can be a bit hard work, it has to be said. And um, Hmm, that's nice, that's got quite a... Now the thing I find, uh, quite balancing sweetness, <laughs> I'll finish my sentence off and that's issue I have with, with Dalmore a lot of the time in American oak it's a bit hard it's sub-industrial it's hard going it has to be said and a lot of that I think is down to the, the hotchpot stills that they have I think they've got two still rooms each with four stills and they're all different shapes and sizes but I think there's a couple that are the same so you know you, your low wines are always going to be of a differing um, differing alcohol level and you're never going to get consistency you know you, you the stillman probably runs off a time sort of you know faints run and you know every time it's going to be different you know you're never going to get consistency and that's the thing about distillery so like consistency you know use the same barley same fermentation time etc 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 um, so how do you cover up inconsistent spirit? Whack it into sherry casks, of course. Anyway, um, so there is a, a little industrial note just hovering in the background, but it's like with everything. Um, there's some green fruit, some honey, apricot, straw-like barley, and lovely sweet rum, which just balances it all up absolutely fabulously. And that is the thing. I don't mind a little bit of hardness a little bit of industrial character as long as there's some balancing sweetness and more often than not you don't find that so it certainly seems to me that using rum octaves in this instance has, has obviously accelerated the maturation so you can release this at five years old but it's also given it that lovely sweetness as a touch of dried fruit coming out now the rum starting over time to just sort of assert itself <coughs> excuse me See what the panel's like. Quite alcoholic, obviously. Kicks off with a straw like barley, bit of apricot, bit of dried nuts, dried nuts, nuts. Um, and then in comes that sweetness of the rum cast. There's a little bittering as well on, on the edges. Um, touch of burnt wood, or toasted wood more like. Um, quite drying, little tannin as well. Again, really nice balance, good progression. Um, I'm going to stick a little drop of water with it and see what that does to it. But yeah, I think that works really quite quite nicely. Um, yes, it's young, but it's not too young. I'm not getting too much faintiness. There is, like I said, a bit of a hardness to it, which you would expect um, from the distillery. Now, that has opened it up really nicely. It's really luscious and sweet now, um, but not too sweet. Um, there's a, a touch of citrus coming out now, a little bit of lime. A little bit more toasted American oak. Uh, 
incidentally, I will say that if you're planning to come along to the whiskey tasting evening we've, we've got on Wednesday, you'll get the opportunity to taste this. So um, this is this is lovely, it's slightly oily now, um, and really harmonious, really really nicely balanced. Let's see what the palate's like. Palette's kind of turned over a little bit in, in so much that instead of opening with the barley, it's now opening more with the sweet, sher um, sweet rummy kind of notes. Um, the barley and the straw kind of coming through on the mid palate. And a little almost violety note, which is quite interesting. Um, and a touch of citrus. Lovely spicy finish. Soft sort of brown sugar and um, cinnamon um, flecked kind of finish. I mean that is absolutely fantastic and um, yeah best thing you can do <laughs> with with Dalmore in my opinion is is stick it in a rum octave of all things. Amazing. But okay so let's move on to the Royal Brackler. So this is an eight year old two years finishing in sherry. Let's see what those give us. Sherry is really punching above its weight, it has to be said. Um, so you're getting lovely, all that kind of slightly walnutty, slightly pruney, um, raisins, sultana. But there's a freshness sitting behind there, there's a touch of citrus. Um, I mean, Brackler itself is quite a lovely fruity mole. Um, and although I'm not getting a huge amount of, of distillery character, it has to be said, it's not a total sherry monster. Um, it should we say sort of like a, um, a half sherry monster, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean it's appealing. There's a, a slight sort of waxiness, um, touch of toast, and again, touch more walnuts. I mean it's it's a, a little bit heavy on the sherry for my own personal taste, but I mean you know I stuck it on the shelf because there are there are people that like this kind of thing, and it's not overtly sherried. Um, there is a semblance of balance here, shall we say. So, let's see what the palate's like. Mm. Ooh, that's a bit of an austere finish. So it kind of opens up with a lot of the American open, getting sort of toffee, um, a little bit of caramel, and then in comes the slightly more leafy, um, slightly more herbally Oloroso. It's a lot of dried tannins, there's a such a licorice, dark chocolate. Little bittering out on the finish, it has to be said, and it's, it is quite dry, quite austere, and I think it does need a little drop of water. But, you know, it's got a, got a pleasant progression. Um, and it's not sort of totally sherry dominated and totally one dimensional, it has to be said. Let's see what a drop of water does to the nose now. Certainly lessens the sherry uh, impact, although it's still there in the background, adding that sweet dried raisinated fruit. Um, a little bit more of the American oak, vanilla. And getting a little bit more of what I would expect from Brackler, that slightly fleshy um, sort of apricot and apple fruit. Yeah, okay. Balance, I don't think it's too bad at all. Let's see what the palate's like. Again, yeah, balance is not too bad at all. Kicks off a little, again like neat with the American oak um, and the sherry kind of comes in more on the mid palate. Pleasant sweetness, it's still a little bitter um, but not as much. Um, still got that sort of dark chocolatey note. Um, a little bit of coffee as well. Um, quite chewy. Um, walnutty, pruney kind of aftertaste of the sherry really sort of comes through on the mid and, and kind of lasts throughout the finish. So I think, yeah, on, on the whole of it, not too badly balanced. A little heavy on the sherry, possibly, but, you know, I'm, I can kind of live with that. Right, okay, 
Okay, so let's move on to the 11 year old Craig Lackey. Now, Craig Lackey can be a little bit on the hit and miss side. I've had some, some pleasant bottlings and I've had some fairly sort of industrial bottlings and it's, it's you never quite know exactly what you're going to get, it must it has to be said, but uh, there's a bit of an industrial hardness there, it has to be said, there's some white fruit, there's a, a bit of white flowers, possibly kind of hyacinth, that sort of, of kind of note, um, it's edgy, it's tight, it's yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit hard going. It has to be said. Again, it's there's a, there's a bit of barley there and a bit of a bit of a vanilla, but it's not quite enough sweetness. I think maybe this one should have been put in a in a, 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 a sherry octave or a, or a, a rum octave to give it a bit of um, a bit of sweetness. But it is what it is. I mean, there's a, there's a, a light sort of limey, herbaly kind of citrus note, which gives it a little bit of a lift. But it is. A little bit, a little bit hard work. It has to be said. Um, let's see what the parts like. Mm, God blast me! Mm, God, that is that's got a kick. I can tell you. Um, it's a bit harder even on the palate as a more industrial character. It's not dirty um, or cardboardy. It's just hard. It's tough. It's rough. It's kind of like, you know, what's the best way of... of it, 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 should we say it lacks a little bit of finesse, should we say. Um, there's some barley. Um, there's some hard caramel, um, stroke toffee, uh, a little bit of spice quite a lot of citrus on on the uh, the aftertaste in actual fact and, and which is emphasized by the alcohol which is kind of mouth is tingling away like a like a mad thing it has to be said and um i mean yeah that's that's pretty bloody intense it has to be said but again it just lacks the sweetness um it lacks you know sweeter barley kind of character to just sort of like offset that sort of industrial note um so let's uh, see what uh, a drop of water does to it it's coaxed out a little bit of sweetness. I'm getting a bit of sort of white licorice and apple, a bit of lime. And yes, there is a bit more of a sweeter barley kind of note. But again, that, that sort of hardness is still underlying it. It's kind of almost a bit of a granity hardness um, now with, with water. Um, and it has softened a little bit, but it's still, it's still a sort of... It's not totally unlovable, shall we say, um, but that's uh, one you'd have to make your mind up about. Let's see what the palette's like now. It's a little bit watery now, a little bit milky oak. Um, it's okay, again, the hardness comes through on the finish, I'm not getting enough sweetness from the barley, um, there's a touch of, uh, of um, spice maybe, um, a little bit of citrus, but it's all a bit sort of like, hmm, you know what I mean, um, not a bad bottling, it has to be said, but it's just kind of, it's the distillery itself, it's the distillery character by and large, although... Um, I have, like I said, I've tasted some really nice bottlings of Craig Lackey, but you know, it is very, very hit and miss. It does seem to have this kind of industrial characteristic, and um, um, it just needs a bit of softening, and it just doesn't quite have enough softness to really sort of float my boat, it has to be said. So, um, okay. <laughs> So let's move on to the Blair Athol. Now, you know, I love old Blair Athol, it has to be said. I mean, yes, you see a lot of it floating around in, in sherry casks, but it's nice when you come across a, an American oak aged um, version thereof. And let's see what uh, the nose gives us. 
Oof, that's lovely. Sort of almost kind of cognac y kind of rancio. You're getting sort of oxidation, dried fruit, um, sultana, dried citrus peel, touch of charred oak, um, barley, honey. I mean, oh, this is just such a complex nose. It is lovely. And, and this is the, one of the things about Blair Athol, it's, it, it can produce a lovely aromatic beautiful whiskey and then they just shove it in at sherry casks and you go oh for god's sake you know it's kind of you know why why do this you know and um this is just aromatic it's just wonderfully mature it's not quite got the sawdusty american oak maturity it's more going down the kind of cognac -y, oxidized fruit mature sort of um road but you know, that is absolutely gorgeous there's a a touch of lime, a little bit of gooseberry as well, you know, sort of, I almost smell the kind of gooseberry skin. Um, oh, yeah, that is absolutely gorgeous. That's the sort, sort of whiskey I can just sort of quite happily just sort of sniff all day. Well, I'd drink all day if, if I have the option, but, um, you know, this is just, just, it's just wonderfully fragrant now. It's just sort of like every time you stick your nose in the glass, a new aroma seems to sort of like um, come up. And um, oh, that is that's gorgeous. Again, not cheap. You wouldn't expect a 21 year old Blair Athol to be particularly cheap, but you know, oh, the quality is so far on the nose. Ah, oh, stunning. And like I said, it doesn't actually feel like it's 63%. I'm not getting an alcohol prickle. I would have thought I would have got an alcohol prickle. Um, it certainly seems less alcoholic than the couple, than a couple of the others. But anyway, let's see what the palate's like now. Yep, I can certainly taste there's quite a bit of alcohol there, but it's not drying the hell out of my mouth, it has to be said. It's really well contained. There's a lot of juicy, waxy, oily citrus, barley, again, oxidised apple, touch of vanilla. Again, I'm not getting the old American sawdusty oak kind of character. It is going down that sort of oxidised fruit kind of character. I'm guessing probably second maybe even third fill american oak um still got some vanilla character almost a little bit of toffee on the finish touch of spice granite um alcohol i mean yeah but that's just it's just so well contained i mean you could taste that and you think yeah okay it's got a reasonable amount of alcohol but you would not have put that down as sort of anywhere near 63 percent has to be said i'm going to put a little drop of water with it and see what uh, what that does to it um See what the nose is, uh, is doing now. Oh, oh, my God, that's opened that up beautifully. Really aromatic, really floral, um, more of that kind of oxidised dried fruit. Loads of barley, loads of citrus. I mean, this is a big nose. It's just sort of enveloping and... Um, absolutely stunning touch of coffee you know sort of light coffee we're not talking sort of particularly dark sort of Colombian coffee it's got a, a lightness to it but those citrus notes are juicy and gorgeous and mmm mmm see what the palate's like now lots of honey now getting a bit of dusty american oak touch of toffee dried fruit again um wow that lingers that's just such a juicy long lingering finish i mean that is absolutely stunning that's a great cask um i mean sometimes you do worry about um 
older whiskies that have a, a high ABV that when you put a little drop of water with them it all just kind of goes bleh, you know um, but this just oh, this is just so well contained and and you can kind of guess that from tasting it neat that the alcohol isn't kind of like poking through and sort of being a little bit spirity and everything the fruit is all died off a bit and you know that is just so harmonious and um wow wow big wow bloody good <laughs> Right, finally, a bit of Milton Duff. 34 year old Milton Duff and no water going to be required with this one, I can tell you. Let's see what the nose gives us. Again, a lovely nose. Deeper, more malty than the Blair Athol. It's got that classic, slightly herbally, heathery kind of Milton Duff kind of uh, character. Um, plenty of dried fruit again not a huge amount of oak we are sort of moving in again I would guess sort of at least second fill American oak so um, lots of, of oxidation character um, some lovely sweet barley I'm actually getting a bit of vanilla now it has to be said sort of sort of kind of coffee marzipan-y sort of uh, notes um, a little bit of oily waxiness touch of touch of citrus oh it's just a stunning stunning nose it has to be said i mean you know i mean you know i know young whiskies have their place but sometimes old whiskies are just like oh you know and um it just it just takes time you just sort of have to live with them and sort of you know can keep sniffing them and sort of you know coaxing out the character and and every time you go back to it, you're going, oh, I just got something new coming out there. And, oh, just, just the balance on that is just absolutely incredible. Really, very, very impressive. Let's see what that's like. Mm. palate starts off a little bit tight um, you can certainly feel the oak it gets a little it's quite subtly dusty um, and then it sort of moves into the middle and you get the juicier fruit you get the dried fruit you get the apricot the barley the heather the oak kind of then comes back on the finish but it's loaded with juicy vanilla um, It's got a lovely kind of green fruit, kind of slight kiwi goo, green gauge. <laughs> Struggling with the name there. Um, kind of note on the finish, a little bit of green grape as well. Um, wow, that is incredible. I mean, the length on that is just phenomenally good. Uh, and like I said, Milton Duff is just one of these one of these whiskies that sort of like you know really flies under the radar. Um, uh, from my notes here it says uh, it's a key component of Ballantines apparently uh, and this is the thing about a lot of the distilleries um, well, most of the distilleries in actual fact yeah that was their that was their uh, that was their aim that was their that was their job was to basically produce malt for the blends and you know they weren't there to, to market their own single malts I mean you know single malt sales uh, you know only been a relatively recent um, invention I suppose for want of a better word um, and uh, you know a distillery made its money by producing what the blenders actually wanted so um, it's only now uh, where we have all these new distilleries coming up and um, they can actually afford to make a living from selling the, their, their malt um, you know as a single malt rather than having to sort of you know make the money by by selling to blenders and um, there are still a number of distilleries that, that they're pretty much their, their sole raison d'etre is to basically supply blends and you just don't see them very often the distilleries 
or their owners don't th feel the need to sort of bottle it because well, we're selling it to the blenders um, and um, you know it only kind of sneaks out through the odd independent bottling I'm not necessarily saying Milton Dove but um, there are a number of distilleries that are like that and you just sort of like think oh, you know I mean things like um, Glen Keith, for example, you know, who the hell has heard of Glen Keith? Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, other whiskies of that kind of ilk that are just sort of absolutely gorgeous and you can see exactly why blenders want them. And uh, it, this is the wonderful thing about the independent sector is that, you know, they, they bottle these things. And a lot of the time you see the same old, same old, you know, you see sort of Glen Lackey, Craig Lackey, um, Mortlack and all that kind of stuff, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of it floating around. They sell it a lot. And then every now and again, you get some real gems, you know, you, you get like the Dalmore in, in uh, uh, an octave cask or you get sort of, you know, things like Glen Keith, for example, or, uh, you know, Milton Duff or uh, a number of these other distilleries that don't really bottle an awful lot. And it's, um, you know, the, 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 the part about the independence that... Uh, or the independent scene that I really, really like. So, yeah. Oh, what a way of finish. Ah, oh, unbelievable. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Well, yeah, like I said, big, big thank you to AD Rattray, to, to everyone there, for, you know, for sending me the samples. I mean, I just, you know, always, always appreciated. And, um, you know, if, 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 if they sort of, you know, do it for me, I suppose, then then you I'll buy them, you know, and uh, um, certainly the Dalmore did it for me. I mean, it's just, it's just just a kind of classic example of sort of the shortcomings of the spirit um, and you play around with casks and you just kind of like balance up those shortcomings and, you know, you add a bit of sweetness and you get something really, really nice at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, Hats off, uh, hats off to Odie Rattray for, for giving that one a go. It could have gone horribly wrong, but it indeed didn't. Um, the eight-year-old um, uh, Rob Rackler. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm not, not so, so hot on that, it has to be said. I mean, you know, for, for a sherry finish, it does show some American oak character. It does show some balance. So it's not too heavy, heavy-handed on the sherry. It's not... It, there's a lot more sherry there than I would ideally like, but you know I can I can kind of live with it. And like I said, I put it on the shelf because I think you know there are customers that like that kind of thing. And uh, I think um, for a sherry finish, it's 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 pretty good. There's no off notes, there's no sulphur, no none of that kind of stuff. So yeah, really nice. Craig and Lackey, um, yeah, it's not really floating my boat. It has to be said. It's it's a little bit hard work, um, and you know although. It's, you could argue, well, that is the, the character of the whiskey, and I'm, you know, I'd be the first one to agree with you on that, it has to be said. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I want to stock the damn thing. Just just because that's what Craig Lackey is like doesn't necessarily mean it's got to go on the shelf. You know, it's, you know, at the end of the day, I've got to feel comfortable in recommending it. And, you know, if, you know, if you want to come into the shop and you say, I want an industrial whiskey, well... I'm tough <laughs> I ain't got any I don't like them you know it's not my kind of cup of tea whiskey should be there to be enjoyed rather than endured um, or you know as, as a, a member of my wine group would, would say you're not here to enjoy yourself you're here to learn something and you know tasting sort of things like Grigalaki Dufftown and the Axis of Evil uh, for, for want of a better word is learning rather than enjoying shall we say half the time but anyway no um, I'm probably being a little bit hard on that it has to be said it's, it, it is what it is at the end of the day um, and well, we'll leave it at that shall we well the undoubted well I mean I don't know whether it was the star of the show I mean that Milton Duff was pretty much um, but oh, that that Blair Athol was bloody good, it has to be said. You know, no, I, I, like I said, I love Blair Athol. It, it, it just produces bloody good whiskey. It's kind of, you know, really sort of, you know, oily, waxy, fruity, you know, really malty. Um, and then, you know, a lot of it that comes out is all just whacked into sherry cast and you're going, oh. I mean, certainly if you take, for example, the um, uh, flora and fauna bottling, the Asher bottling, I mean, yeah, it's so variable 
I mean, I've tasted bottlings of that, that all you can taste is just a mouthful of sherry, and other times it's got some balance. Uh, and yet, people seem to love it. You know, I think if you tasted that, you'd go, oh, I see what you're on about now. Um, and the 34-year-old Milton Duck one, my God, that was that was incredible. I mean, I had to sort of, <laughs> had to have some of that, and I had to put that one on the shelf. Yes, it's not cheap. I know that not everybody's going to have the, the deep pockets to afford that, but, you know, uh, uh, and I know a lot of you probably won't have the opportunity to taste it, so you just have to take my word for it that it was just, mmm, mmm, stunningly good, it has to be said. So... Anyway, there you go. That's uh, this week's episode of the show in the bag. I have um, one, two, three, four, five. I've at least five episodes all kind of lined up. You, you, you ought to see the side of the desk. There's bottles here. There's bottles over there. There's bottles down there. Um, there's bottles there. There's bottles in the cupboard downstairs, uh, in the kitchen cupboard, underneath the stairs. There's bottles absolutely bloody well everywhere. I mean, you know, I could probably keep going for years on what I've actually got stashed around here. But anyway, I've got sort of at least sort of half a dozen episodes of the show kind of lined up and ready to go. And, um, well, anyway, we're, we're talking about A.D. Rattray and, uh, you know, hopefully they'll carry on bottling some bloody good stuff like this Milton Duff. So, um, until uh, until next week, all that's left to say is good grammar and good afternoon.